Hi, my name is Wendy Chung. I'm one of the investigators for the Simons VIP study, and I'm so privileged to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you today about some of the medical conditions associated with the 16P11.2 deletion and duplication. This is information that we also presented at the family meeting in the summer of 2015. And so for those of you who either weren't able to come to the meeting or just wanted to be able to hear the information once more, we'll be reviewing this information together with you in the next few minutes. I also want to gratefully acknowledge that from the very beginning all of the families who generously contributed so much of their time and energy to make all of this information possible to the rest of the community. They were very kind in terms of being able to share information about themselves and their family members, and it's really a debt of gratitude we owe to all of those families who were so generous. What I'd like to do is tell you how it is that we arrived at the information I'm going to be telling you about, and I hope this information is going to be practically helpful to you and, and your families um, as we go through. I'll also encourage you, if there are any questions that come up uh, as you're listening to this recording, we have an Ask the Expert button at Simon's VIP Connect, and I encourage you to use that. Uh, those questions come to me and, if appropriate, other members of the team. And so if you have specific questions, feel free to utilize that. So what we're going to be talking about is what we've learned over the past four or five years with families. When we started out this project of Simon's VIP, we had some very specific goals in mind. We wanted to be able to understand what was going on with individuals with 16P11.2 and eventually some other genes um, and some other copy number variants. And specifically, we wanted to understand what some of the medical challenges were as well as what some of the uh, challenges were in terms of how the brain functions. So whether that was cognition or the brain working uh, and some of the behaviors that individuals have, how that was specifically related to autism with the idea about how we could do things to be able to improve quality of life, um, meaning the support and the care for individuals with these particular genetic differences. In particular, we realize that this is not something um, that's just um, sort of static. It doesn't stay the same, but yet there's the opportunity uh, potentially to be able to intervene and to be able to hope get folks on the right course, especially when this information is available to families early. So we've, as I'll be showing you and others will be showing you, um, how some of this information changes over time. Let me first take a minute to talk about the genetics themselves. Um, this information I hope is helpful to some of the families. We're talking about uh, a region on chromosome number 16. That's where the number 16 in the name comes from. And it's on what we call the petite or the short arm of chromosome 15, 16, and that's where the P comes from. And the specific address is 11.2. Um, within this particular region, I'm going to be talking very specifically about a region that's called breakpoint 4 to breakpoint 5. Uh, and any of the genetic counselors who work with us on Simon's VIP can help you and your family understand whether or not your particular 16P region is the one that I'm going to be talking about today. But very specifically, I'm going to talk about um, a region that's common to most of the families. And this information uh, has been fine-tuned for those families that have either deletions or duplications of that region. Within this particular region are 29 different genes. And um, for individuals with the deletion, rather than having two copies of the gene, they have one copy of each of these 29 genes in this region. And for families in which there's a duplication, rather than having two copies, there are actually three copies of the genes within this region. And having too much or too little seems to have an effect in terms of how the brain and the body works. Uh, and that's one of the things that we've been studying is what some of those effects can be. In particular, for individuals who have uh, the deletion or duplication, um, this is something that can be passed down to other children in the family if one of the parents has it. And in general, if one of the parents has either the deletion or duplication, there is a 50-50 chance of passing that down to a child. Um, so in other words, it's like flipping a coin, 50% chance a child would have it or 50% not. Um, that's what I'm showing very briefly in this slide, although this is a bit confusing, so I'm just going to skip on over, but to say that it's really 50-50 that we're talking about. Now, in some of the families, either 
through your doctor where this was diagnosis was originally made, or potentially through Simon's VIP, we may have done some testing of other family members, such as mothers and fathers. And in that case, um, what may be confusing to some of you is that not all of these genetic changes were inherited. That is that in particular for many of our deletion families, this particular 16P deletion actually started with the individual that uh, came to clinical attention, um, usually a child that came in for issues related to either uh, slower development or autism or seizures or birth defect. Um, and after the parents were tested, in some of the families it's been determined that this was actually a new genetic change or not one that was inherited from either of the parents. Uh, and that is something we see with fair frequency. And I know it can be confusing because in this particular case it is genetic. It's encoded within the genes. It's definitely on chromosome 16 with the genetic information, yet it was not inherited, so it didn't run in the family. Um, even though it wasn't inherited from one of the parents, it is something that for that individual that, that carries that deletion or duplication, something that they can pass down to their children in the future. This is a slide to be able to show you that when we started along this journey um, almost exactly five years ago in August 2010, uh, we started out with very few families. But over time, the number of members who had either the deletion or duplication shown in green has grown over time, as well as the number of members within the community who haven't necessarily uh, participated in the research study, but they've been either family members, uh, sometimes close, sometimes farther family members, have been involved in the community um, and are supporting individuals with 16P. Within this community, uh, again, I'm proud to say that it now encompasses hundreds of families, um, and I think that's a really important thing to be able to have so many families that are there to be able to share uh, their experiences with each other, and I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and to also show importantly that this continues to grow over time in a very important way so that hopefully we get more and more information, especially as we think about the future um, in terms of teenage years and young adulthood. Um, the more information we can have for families, I think the more helpful this community is. Uh, I pointed out specifically that there's something that we called phase two, uh, and I'll try and explain. You'll hear from some of the other presenters that are talking about some of their work. In phase one, we very specifically had individuals come to some of our clinical sites to be able to um, get evaluated. And in phase two, we had individuals, we opened this up so that individuals from all around the country, even all around the world, uh, who weren't necessarily able to come to our clinical sites could participate. And so uh, that's the change that we had over time. And you can see the increases in numbers, opening that up to more families um, hopefully helped more people to be able to participate within um, this combined effort. So in this slide, I know it's a little bit busy, um, but what I've done, I'm going to focus on the areas that are either the dark blue, those are the 16P deletion families, or the red bars. If you focus on those two sets of bars, those are the most important ones for the audience today. Um, that's showing you the distribution and ages of individuals who have participated in Simon's VIP. So this is, again, to be able to show you that for the deletion carriers in particular, we have individuals across really all the different age ranges from little ones who are uh, either even toddlers um, to some of the kids who are preschool and even going through um, many of the children are in adolescence. Um, but to realize and appreciate that for the deletion carriers, we don't have so many who are over age 18. Um, and so being able to understand what uh, long-term things are, I think we still have some limits in their information. And just to appreciate that as we're going through some of these, uh, in the information about medical issues specifically. Uh, on the other hand, for our duplication carriers, with those red bars, you can see that for those families or those individuals, we actually have a more even distribution. Um, we don't have quite as many as we do for the deletion carriers, but you'll see that we have many who are adolescents uh, and then even some who are adults as well. And so that's the data that we'll be sharing with you today. Um, 
to look at what an enormous uh, group of, of families this represents, uh, I'm simply showing you a map of the United States to realize that you're not alone. Um, there are many, many other families like you, uh, whether it be on the West Coast, the East Coast, uh, down south, up in, in the central area of the country. Really, we have many, many families who've come together to be able to share their experiences. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud to say that we have families really across the country, and this may be helpful if you think about your particular geographic region, uh, how you might be able to reach out to even someone who might be um, physically close by. So the way that we did this uh, first part of the study, this was now what we call the phase one part of the study, uh, was very involved for families. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge really the enormous uh, contribution and dedication of the families who were in phase one. They are just um, really uh, a joy and a pleasure to work with and to get to know your families and your children. Um, they really gave up a lot of time and energy to be able to work with us and to to really provide some very detailed information that you're going to be hearing more about from the other Simons VIP investigators. Um, they went to three different sites around the country, um, in Boston at Boston Children's, uh, in Texer, Texas, rather, down at Texas Children's Hospital, and then on the West Coast at the University of Washington in Seattle. With that, they went through oftentimes uh, two days of really intensive evaluations. Um, we went through and asked about information about medical histories. We were uh, kind enough to have the families actually give us copies of their medical history information, their medical records, uh, information about hospitalizations, doctor's visits, um, various different MRIs and EEGs. We used that information to be able to uh, hopefully be able to prevent or present accurate information to the other families. Um, and as we did that, we also, in some cases, had the families go through uh, MRI imaging at those clinical sites. In addition to that, we did very detailed uh, assessments in terms of brain and behavior to understand everything from IQ to whether or not individuals had autism uh, to understanding um, very detailed things about, uh, for instance, how their nervous system was working and evaluations by neurologists um, to do all sorts of um, things to be able to see how they were moving, how strong they were, how coordinated they were, um, various different things to be able to see how uh, the body was working. In those cases, we had both individuals with the 16P deletion or duplication perform those studies, but we also had generously other members of the family who didn't have the 16P deletion or duplication. They served a very important role as comparators or being able to see uh, within those families what things might be like if you didn't have that particular uh, genetic 16P change. Um, and so, again, this was just a, a remarkable um, donation of time and energy from these families to be able to have not just one family member, but oftentimes three or four or even five family members participate in these studies. Um, in addition to that, there were a subset of those individuals who actually came out and did a second visit, either in San Francisco uh, at UCSF, University of California at San Francisco, or in Philadelphia at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. During those two-day visits, we did even more uh, intensive and detailed ways of looking at the brain. This included imaging studies in an MRI scanner during which individuals uh, would do various things they were asked to do, um, watching movies, um, some other things that we asked them to respond to that they saw. And then they also, uh, as you'll be hearing about from others, did things where we were looking at the electrical activity of the brain as well. Um, and so those were what we call the MEG studies. So within that, um, again, it took a lot of time and energy, and other investigators are going to be talking about those studies. So. I'm going to break this down now uh, into the deletion and duplication carriers in the next set of slides. So uh, you don't have to pay attention to all of the information, but pay attention to the information that's directly relevant to your family. 
for the deletion carriers, we had approximately 100 individuals uh, on whom the information I'm going to tell you about is based. And for the duplication carriers, we had slightly less than 100 families uh, or individuals um, in the information I'm going to provide to you. So uh, the next couple slides are organized in the same way. Um, looking at the slides on your left, that middle column on your to, slightly to the left is for the deletion carriers, and the column on the right is for the uh, duplication carriers. And along the left side, on the column called medical problems, are the various different things that we saw when we asked family about some of their medical history that they reported back to us. And again, uh, when it was possible, we tried to go back and confirm this by reviewing medical records. Um, the information we're providing is based on approximately 100 individuals in each of the cases, and slightly less for duplications. Um, and so this is useful information, but it is based on, uh, again, a somewhat limited size of about 100 individuals. I'm going to talk about the deletion carriers first, uh, and then I'll talk about the duplication carriers on each of the next, this slide and the next slide. So one of the things that we saw in deletion carriers was that across the various ages, there were definitely issues with low muscle tone. And that's a relatively common thing that we see in children with developmental delay, and it's certainly something that can improve with physical therapy. Uh, some of the other things that we saw that were common, although still not in the majority of individuals, were problems in terms of constipation. And I'll just point out that there were also some other gastrointestinal complaints that uh, individuals had. These included gastroesophageal reflux, or some that people will call uh, reflux disease. Um, so in other words, things coming up from the stomach up to the first part of the intestine or even sometimes to the mouth, as well as diarrhea. And uh, various. sometimes individuals even had alternating problems with both constipation and diarrhea. So these gastrointestinal problems overall certainly more common in individuals with the deletion than, for instance, in some of their siblings uh, that did not have the deletion. In addition to that, and an important factor is that we saw that ear infections were actually um, slightly more common than we saw in siblings. So about a third of individuals had problems with ear infections. Um, these weren't the types of things that in general were problems like severe immunodeficiencies, let me be clear. Um, these were, if you will, regular ear infections, but they seemed to take a little bit longer to clear those ear infections, and they seemed to be a little bit more frequent than some of the siblings. In particular, the reason that I raise this is because the ear infections certainly do clear, but one of the other challenges, in fact, probably the biggest initial challenge um, is for language in children with the deletion. That is, learning language and learning how to speak is something that is particularly challenging. And one of the issues becomes that with repeated ear infections or even just fluid in the ear, it can feel like you're underwater. Um, and in particular, being able to hear language and being able to hear people talking to you becomes quite difficult with ear infections and can be an additional impediment or an additional hurdle for young children as they're learning language and learning to speak. And so one of the practical tips that I'd like to give families is if ear infections seem to be very frequent, and the number for me is usually three ear infections in one year, then I tend to recommend, or at least uh, if not ear tubes directly, at least a consultation with a kind of doctor called an ear, nose, and throat doctor, or an otolaryngologist uh, is the technical term for that, to see whether or not there's something that can be done to clear these ear infections and make sure that that's not an impediment. Um, in addition, we saw some other issues, in particular parents told us that their children tended to be clumsier. Um, this was something that they had trouble in terms of coordination in particular. And uh, it was something that we also noticed when the neurologist evaluated those children. And again, about a third of those individuals with the deletion were clumsy. In addition, and importantly, uh, seizures were noted in about 25% of the individuals with the deletion. So seizures, again, definitely more common than in the general population. The good news, on the other hand, is that the seizures oftentimes 
were treated very effectively by a single medication and did not always require medication forever. Um, oftentimes, young children needed them, but as they got older, may not have required medication for seizures permanently. So important that if you see, as a parent, anything that looks like an abnormal type of movement, um, what we would call movement of the arms and down, back and forth, sort of um, uh, rhythmic movement, moving of the arms. Or if you see that the child is staring blankly and seems to be lost in outer space and you can't bring them back right away, those are reasons to be able to see your pediatrician and see your neurologist if you have one. I find it often helpful if parents can videotape those episodes um, to be able to know, uh, to be able to show rather their doctor, uh, because it gives the doctor a much better sense of what's going on. So if you have that capability on your phone, on your iPad, um, a helpful hint if you see something that you're worried about. Also important and very specific to the deletion carriers is that as the children were getting older, many of them had problems with weight gain. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because sometimes when the children are young, it's just the opposite. They're having trouble gaining weight and they may not be eating very well. But oftentimes when the children are hitting either um, pre-adolescence or adolescence, so by the time they turn about age 10, uh, weight can get to be a bigger issue. And many of them start to um, have problems with eating more uh, as they're getting older, and in particular if they're on medications um, that can be used for behavior, and particularly antipsychotic medications, um, this can cause additional problems in terms of the weight gain. So something to keep in mind, because again, uh, being able to intervene early can oftentimes be more effective. And one of the things that we want to do is to be able to encourage healthy habits. That includes healthy eating habits um, in terms of, for instance, uh, drinking drinks that are not um, excess calories. Uh, so for instance, limiting drinks to water uh, is a very good thing, um, or not necessarily having a lot of sugared beverages. So in other words, sodas, uh, or even juice many times has empty calories in it. Um, in addition, promoting a healthy, active lifestyle is good. So in other words, giving kids the opportunities to be able to have playgrounds to play in, being active in sports, uh, have opportunities to ride bicycles, uh, but be able to get uh, exercise and be able to lead that active lifestyle starting from an early age is good. Okay, switching gears on that same slide to the right side, we're talking about now the children with the duplications. Uh, and in these cases, it's um, similar topics, but you'll notice that the percentages are slightly different. So again, we're seeing some themes in terms of low muscle tone being more common in about half of the children, a variety of uh, gastrointestinal issues related to, again, both constipation uh, as well as, in some cases, reflux, uh, but less commonly, diarrhea. On the other hand, for the adults, um, and I'm pointing out specifically for the adults, ulcers, stomach ulcers or gastric ulcers were more common. And so uh, important to think about and remember, and there are medications that can be used to treat those. So important that if you're having problems with stomach upset, to let your doctor know and see whether or not that's a possibility. In addition, as we talked about some of the brain functions, um, duplication families also reported trouble with coordination or clumsiness, as well as in some cases, tremors. Um, these were not things that seemed to interfere with functioning in any way, but sometimes the hands uh, had a slight tremor that we could see, or in some cases, problems um, with coordination of movement or what we call ataxia. Um, in the duplication carriers, one of the things I can reassure you about is that seizures were not very common for duplication carriers, so that's good to know. And weight, in contrast, was again not as big an issue in terms of problems with obesity. So a slightly different profile, slightly different challenges, and important as you may be connecting with other families through Simon's VIP or other, where, other places to remember if you're a duplication, uh, talk to other families with duplications. And if you're a deletion, talk with other families with deletions so that uh, it's not too confusing to, or mixing apples and oranges. 
So continuing on in this theme, um, these are some of the less frequent medical issues that we were seeing, either in deletion carriers in that middle column or duplication carriers on the right column. Uh, again, I will start with the deletion carriers. Um, we did see some relatively infrequent, but some issues with hearing. Uh, those are, again, important to recognize and pick them up. Uh, can be done easily with a screen at your pediatrician's office, uh, at least as the first line. And again, not very common, but important to be able to make sure that that's not an additional factor in terms of learning language. Um, one of the issues that I was mentioning a little bit with the ear infections, some of the families have been noticing increased problems with re repeated infections or recurrent infections. And they have been relatively infrequent, but there are some families who've noticed more serious immunological problems. Uh, and so a good thing to bring to the attention of your doctor if that seems to be an issue. Again, I would say these aren't life-threatening issues, but they can be problems that can keep children uh, sick from uh, and out of school and take more time to be able to heal and recover from those infections. Importantly, there are a couple things that we saw with the uh, bones of the body that started to emerge, usually in the teenage years. Um, in particular, we know that the vertebrae or the bones that make up the back can be misshapen in some cases. So important to be able to get an x-ray of the backbone to see if that's the case, because that can lead to problems with curvature of the spine or scoliosis, in particular as the children are getting to be older in teenage years. At that time, the body's going through some rapid growth, and there can be issues in terms of um, the spine not growing and aligning perfectly straight. In addition, um, there can be uh, relatively infrequent causes or problems in terms of um, the rib cage forming, leading to what we call pigeon chest. And that's something that usually doesn't need any sort of medical intervention, uh, but just to know so that you don't become worried about it. In addition, there was uh, low frequency or relatively rare occurrences of various different birth defects. They tended not to be any one type of birth defect, but the good news about this is that if they are not present, um, they don't suddenly come up later in life. So if any of uh, you had evaluations to evaluate, for instance, uh, or congenital heart disease, something like an echocardiogram, if that was normal, it does not need to be repeated uh, because that doesn't come up later. Congenital heart disease or holes in the heart were something that we saw slightly more commonly, as well as some of the things that we saw because we did imaging of the brain included uh, a cyst on the brain or in the spinal cord. Um, these were not very common and usually didn't need intervention, but those can occur. As well as, as I said, these were just really in single individuals that we saw these, but some other birth defects um, that included, for instance, missing a uterus in a female, as well as some problems with, for instance, uh, the bones in the brain, or, or the bones rather covering the brain, the skull being fused, and uh, in some cases needing to have surgery to be able to separate those. Again, those are not very frequent, and they're the types of things that your doctor generally would have noticed already. For duplication carriers, moving on to the column in the right, again, we saw uh, some of these issues were more common. In particular, problems with hearing were a little bit more frequent with our duplication carriers. We continued to see uh, a small but important number of children who had problems in terms of having repeated infections. So important to get those vaccinations and making sure to minimize those infections. Uh, and also we saw some problems in terms of, again, those bones in the back or the vertebrae, although less frequent than we had seen in the, the deletion carriers. In contrast to the obesity that we saw with our deletion carriers, in general, there were more problems with gaining weight. That is, children being uh, skinnier and having trouble being able to gain sufficient amounts of weight, especially when they were young, um, in the first two or three years of life. And so we saw that in about 17% of our individuals with duplication carriers. We also saw in our duplication carriers, in the children in particular, uh, an increased frequency of congenital heart disease. And so an echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart that's a good way to be able to evaluate for congenital heart disease and see whether or not it's present. 
We have enjoyed learning from the families at the family meetings um, and being able to get insight that they can really only they can provide. And I still remember in the family meeting from 2012, uh, we asked families about things that they had observed and concerns that they had, and they had brought to our attention this increase in frequency of infections that they had seen, and in particular some issues that they had noticed with the temperature of their children. So they had noticed that they thought that um, both 16P deletion and duplication carriers seemed to be a little hotter. Um, and we actually did a survey of families after that meeting and asked them specifically if they had noticed any of those issues either uh, in their children with the deletion or duplication or in their other children in the family who didn't have the deletion or duplication. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a summary of the responses from all the families, um, not just the ones who are at the family meeting, but also those who were in the community unable to attend the family meeting. And I think you'll see that whether it was for the deletion families or the duplication uh, families, proband simply means in this case the person with the deletion or the person with the duplication, you'll see that um, there were some issues or differences that were noted both in terms of temperature during the day and temperature in the night. And I will say um, that families reported us to that they were warmer, as well as problems with sweating. Um, so as a manifestation that they might be hotter during the day or at night. Uh, and importantly, as I said, the families were kind enough to provide information also about the other brothers and sisters in those families. And I think you can uh, agree that many of those siblings uh, did not have those same issues. So it wasn't simply that you know, folks lived down south and it was hotter uh, in that part of the country. Um, this was really something that they were noticing as a distinct difference in their children with the deletion or duplication. So we took that information and we wanted to be able to quantify it a little bit better. And so many of you uh, were kind enough to wear what we call eye buttons. Um, these were like um, Little, they're about the size of a dime um, batteries that, or they look like batteries, I should say, but they're actually thermometers that we had uh, individuals wear for several consecutive days that allowed us to get um, measures of temperature both during the day and during the night as these individuals were going about doing their regular activities. Um, and this is showing you traces from three different families. On the left, two deletion families, and on the right, one duplication family. And what you can see, for instance, on the left with the deletion is that those uh, lines on the top, the dark blue dot lines, were from members of the family with the deletion who wore the eye buttons. And then lower than that, either light blue on the top or red below, were family members without the deletion who wore the eye button at the same exact time. And what you can see is that this actually now demonstrates that there was a difference. Um, it wasn't five degrees, but it was about a half to one degree difference in temperature between the deletion carriers and their other family members. Um, on the right, you'll see similarly for the duplication carriers that, again, you'll see that the duplication carrier was running a little bit warmer um, than the other family members, again, giving support to what the families were telling us. So as I had alluded to before, uh, we wanted to be able to extend the participation within the Simons VIP study to many other families, including ones who weren't able to physically come to one of our sites. And so we uh, started collecting data online on the computer and via telephone to allow more families' ability to participate. So in Simons VIP phase two, um, many more family members were able to, or many more families, I should say, were able to participate, as well as it allowed us the opportunity to collect information on individuals over time to see how children were developing and growing up and to see if there might be different challenges that they would face when they were older than when they were younger. Um, this is also being used to help us understand what some of the biggest challenges are for families so that we can prioritize where we expend our efforts in the future. In addition, we've also expanded uh, the family beyond 16P to also some other families such as 1Q and have developed resources in the Simons VIP community that hopefully will help all of these different families who face some, some similar challenges and some uh, hopefully similar solutions. 
I want to take the, a moment to acknowledge all the many people who have contributed to the Simon's VIP study. Um, believe it or not, this slide doesn't even include everyone, but it includes many of the different uh, researchers at the various different institutions that I mentioned. It's taken a really uh, large team of very dedicated people over the past five years to do this, uh, and they've really been an inspiration to be able to work with so many talented, smart, uh, and um, really energetic individuals uh, and to partner their, their insight into what your insight is as families. Even beyond um, the, the team that I'm showing you here, we've had lots of other dedicated individuals uh, who are researchers really around the world who don't always work directly with the families, but in fact may work on things like mouse models or zebrafish models or uh, even with proteins and test tubes to try and understand better what the particular challenges are for 16P and the genes involved in 16P. And so this was taken from a workshop that we had at the Simons Foundation uh, to show you that at the foundation we're really um, going beyond just the support directly for the Simons VIP study, but really thinking about all the dimensions of the research and trying to develop a comprehensive strategy to understand 16P better and to be able to come up with better solutions and answers to many of the questions that you have. So I will conclude uh, for today with this information, uh, but just to again thank all of the families that participated. It's really based on their information that we can help extend this information and distribute this information to other families that are more recently learning about the diagnosis. Um, I encourage you, if you're willing, to be able to contribute yourselves to the online questionnaires uh, to be able to help make this information even uh, more helpful to other families down the road. And in addition, uh, as I said, to be able to just acknowledge the many people who've contributed to all of this, all of this information that we know. If you have specific questions uh, about your particular family, again, feel free to go to the Ask the Expert uh, button or send rather an email to the Ask the Expert on the Simon VIP Connect website. Uh, we'll be glad to do anything we can to either answer your question or to figure out uh, what information we need to gather to answer your question for the future. Thank you.